Chapter 4, Evolution, Fact and Fantasy, from Wolfgang Smith, Cosmos and Transcendence. The central thesis of Darwinism is the transformist hypothesis, the contention that one species can transform itself into another. How this may come about, through what causes or biological mechanisms, that is another question. The primary issue, in any case, is whether the higher species have evolved from primitive ancestors, and for that matter, whether a bona fide transformation of species has ever taken place. Just as no two organisms belonging to a given species can be exactly alike, so too there is doubtless a certain variability and elasticity, one could say, in the species itself. Thus, it is certainly possible that a species may adapt itself to changes in the environment or that it may develop certain beneficial traits. Now, whether or not such transformations can in due time lead to the formation of a new species depends, of course, on what precisely one means by that term. And this is not a simple question. The issue has been debated extensively, and it is not clear whether there exists a single natural criterion, such as the ability to interbreed, which is in every respect satisfactory. But in any case, it cannot be doubted that microevolutionary transformations do occur in nature, whatever may be their extent as measured on the conventional taxonomic scale. The real question, thus, is not whether what we have defined to be a species is in fact invariable, but whether an evolutionary transformation can ever produce what we would unequivocally recognize as a new type of plant or animal. In other words, there is a gray area within which microevolution operates. What the transformist hypothesis affirms is that macroevolutionary transformations, too, have occurred. As a scientific theory, the transformist claim is to be judged on the basis of observable facts. What then, we must ask, are the principal sources of empirical evidence bearing upon this question, and what are the relevant findings? In the first place, one needs to consider the facts of paleontology, for it is evident that the fossil record constitutes indeed our one and only means of direct observation when it comes to the ancient forms of life. It is the telescope, so to speak, which renders the panorama of primordial life visible to some extent, and so provides a conceivable basis for the testing of evolutionary hypothesis. Here, etched in stone, are the hard facts with which the theory must accord. Clearly, what the evolutionists would like to find in the paleoontological record are chronologically ordered collections of fossils bearing all the earmarks of an evolutionary sequence. Finely graduated chains, namely exhibiting phylogenetic morphological variations as one proceeds from earlier to later specimens. Yet, even though he should find such chains in abundance, he is still to establish their evolutionary origin, and it is obvious that paleontology itself can offer no warrant for this step. As the French biologist Louis Bonnard has observed, to see proof of a real descent and such a concordance between the placement of morphological types and their chronological position is to adjoin to this concordance which alone is the positive fact, the hypothesis of affiliation, whose verification is impossible and degree of certainty is always debatable. In other words, the transformist hypothesis is not directly verifiable in terms of paleontological findings. On the other hand, it is likewise clear that a sufficient dearth of quasi-evolutionary fossil sequences would prove fatal to the theory. For, if we suppose that the earth has been populated for vast ages by plants and animals constituting transitional forms, and if it can be shown that during these periods the geological mechanism which accounts for the formation of fossils was operative, then it would stand to reason that the transitional forms should be represented in the paleontological record. But by and large, they are not. And from the start, this has proved to be a major stumbling block for the protagonist of evolution. As the matter stood in 1859, and even more as it stands today, fossils do not make friendly witnesses for the evolutionists.
Darwin himself, moreover, has perceived this very clearly. Thus, in The Origin of Species, he declares that this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Repeatedly, he raises the crucial question, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? And his answer is this, the explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. This is clearly the critical point, now as then, which the evolutionists need to establish. He who rejects this view of the imperfection of the geological record, writes Darwin, will rightly reject the whole theory. One particularly troubling instance of the generic difficulty is the complete absence, or at the very least, extreme paucity, of organic fossils in the Precambrian strata. Here is the problem in Darwin's own words. There is another and allied difficulty, which is much more serious. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known falciferous rocks. Most of the arguments which have convinced me that all the existing species of the same group are descended from a single progenitor apply with equal force to the earliest known species. For instance, it cannot be doubted that all the Cambrian and Silurian trilobites are descended from one crustacean, which must have lived long before the Cambrian age, and which probably differed greatly from any known animal. Consequently, if the theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapse, as long as, or probably far longer than, the whole interval from the Cambrian age to the present day, and that during these vast periods, the world swarmed with living creatures. To the question why we do not find rich phosphorus deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. The case at present must remain inexplicable, and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. In the light of present geological knowledge, one may add that the Precambrian strata amount to about four-fifths of the Earth's crust and correspond to a period of some 900 million years of geological history, beginning approximately 1,500 million years ago. Thus, Darwin's surmise as to the enormous duration of the Precambrian age proves to be right. It is about one and one half times as long as the entire interval from the Cambrian age to the present day. But this only accentuates the main problem. For so far as the fossil record is concerned, these gigantic Precambrian strata, which in some locations reveal over 5,000 feet of unbroken layers of sedimentary rock, ideally suited for the imprinting of fossils, have proved to be virtually blank. Admittedly, there have been sporadic reports of Precambrian finds purporting to derive from algae, bacteria, or even wormholes caused by burrowing, but these have again been disputed and in some instances definitely disqualified. This contrasts with well over a thousand Cambrian genera representing more than 5,000 species. More plentiful than the Precambrian fossils, it would appear are the theories which have been put forward to explain their absence. In a brief summary published in 1957, which is undoubtedly far from complete, Dewar discusses no less than 12 theories of this type, all of relatively recent origin, and concludes that none of them is particularly cogent. In any case, the very profusion of theories occasioned by the difficulty in question attest to the seriousness of the problem and to the absence of any definitive solution. The basic difficulty, namely a lack of intermediate forms, persists right through the fossil-rich Cambrian and later strata, as has been pointed out repeatedly beginning with Darwin. The fact is that the majority of the fundamental types in the animal kingdom present themselves to us without antecedent from a paleontological point of view, as the parrot remarked in 1907.
and it remains true, as every paleontologist knows, reiterates Simpson half a century later, that most new species, genera, and families, and that nearly all categories above the level of families, appear in the record suddenly and are not led up to by gradual, completely continuous transitional sequences. Naturally, the evolutionist is obliged to account for this circumstance in a way that will safeguard his theory, and as we have noted in the Precambrian case, this need has given rise to a profusion of special theories. During the present century, moreover, the problem has been considerably complicated due to the fact that the various facile solutions have been ruled out through notable advances in paleontology and related fields. In particular, it has become far more difficult to plead the extreme imperfection of the geological record. According to an interesting study by Dewar and Levitt Yeats, for instance, first published in 1932, it turns out that a surprisingly high percentage of extant genera within two sample groups, i.e. mammals and mollusks, are represented in the fossil record. In the case of land animals, for example, the percentages range from 100 in the case of European genera to 56 for the Australian, and as might be expected, the figures are still better in the case of marine mammals. But even for volant genera, i.e. bats, where one would expect the smallest likelihood of fossilization, one finds that some 26% of the 215 extant genera appear in the record. Considering the fact that genera constitute a rather fine gradation on the taxonomic scale, these data accord ill with the tenet of extreme imperfection. As the matter stands, the only avenue of escape from the negative evidence of paleontology seems to lie in some feasible concept of cryptogenesis, or hidden evolution, of which a number of variants have been proposed. One possible approach, and this applies especially to the higher stages of evolution corresponding to the fossiferous strata, is to postulate special phases of development during which the transformation of species takes place with such rapidity as to elude detection via the fossil record. In line with this general idea, one encounters such concepts as Severtov's aeromorphosis, Schindelwolf's explosive evolution, Zauner's episodes of intense evolution, and Simpson's tachytitely. Somewhat different types of cryptogenesis have also been considered, such as De Beers' clandestine evolution. Yet all these theories suffer apparently from the same fundamental drawback, which is simply the lack of positive evidence. The best that can be hoped for in this domain, it would seem, is to avoid obvious conflict with the known facts. The same observation applies to the various genealogical trees that have been postulated from time to time, beginning with Hegel's famous specimen. So far as the finer branches are concerned, the claim has frequently been made that these can be certified by an actual fossil sequence. But quite apart from the logical problem already alluded to, the fact that no such sequence could possibly attest to an actual filiation, there are other difficulties here, which are frequently overlooked. For example, it has been demonstrated that starting from a given collection of fossils belonging to some group, it may be possible to extract a number of entirely different quasi-evolutionary sequences, depending on whether one chooses the structure of the teeth, let us say, or of the paws as the relevant factor. And as much as these sequences are not compatible with any one postulated genealogy, we must conclude that some of them, at least, are artificial. But then, by what conceivable criterion can we distinguish between artificial and genuine sequences? As Bonnier points out in this connection, our mind can well in the study of tertiary mammals, for example, establish certain comparisons and certain ideal relations between members of these groups. This is likewise the task par excellence of comparative anatomy. But in most cases, one goes beyond the facts if one interprets these relations as denoting a real filiation and actual descent.
Abel is of the opinion that in the entire domain of the animal kingdom, there are no more than five or six series of forms which are authentically evolutionary, that is to say, emitting the hypothesis of an actual descent through gradual transformation. When it comes to the main branches, on the other hand, the matter becomes still more tenuous. For it is here, especially, that the discontinuous aspect of the fossil record comes into full play, and where, in place of a conceivable transition sequence, however uncertain, we typically encounter a blank. How, then, can one presume to bridge these gaps? Considering the virtual impossibility of doing so, even with a modicum of scientific rigor, it is not surprising that claims to this effect should have aroused considerable controversy, and that some authorities, at any rate, have remained skeptical. Thus, Bonnior, for one, has this to say on the subject. It would be to underestimate the imagination of the experts to believe that in the face of the cryptic origin of the great philia, they should be lacking in resources. Haeckel had already pointed the way by inventing theoretical ancestral forms, the protovertebrates, protocelacians, protoamniota, and protomammals, which have disappeared in the course of ages or which, in the advance of paleontology, will someday be discovered. Haeckel was never embarrassed in populating the ancient seas and continents with schemata, koken. Now, one can remark that the phylogenetic trees of the zoologists proceed, in a specious manner, from the same gratuitous imagination. The leaves do indeed represent groups of real beings, but the trunk and the large branches are only an illusion or a subterfuge in so far as they establish an inexistent continuity between groups. They are only an hypothesis introduced to support another hypothesis, and on the whole have no more value than petitio principii. Unlike other scientific theories, which enable one to predict previously unknown facts, and which can therefore be tested in a more or less cogent manner, the doctrine of evolution has virtually no predictive content. Basically, one argues in behalf of the evolutionist contention simply by adducting known facts which the theory purports to explain frequently, as we have seen, with the aid of other hypotheses which have been introduced specifically for this purpose. Now it is clear that such an argument derives whatever cogency it may have from an auxiliary premise to the effect that the given phenomena cannot be explained equally well on any other reasonable basis. But this obviously poses a fundamental problem. Just how does one decide whether a conceivable alternative is reasonable? Is it reasonable, for example, to postulate some form of teleological causation? Or is it reasonable to view the matter in a metaphysical or a theological perspective? In practice, to be admissible in the eyes of the scientific community, an alternative must evidently accord with the prevailing Weltanschauung. Once again, therefore, we find ourselves in a situation where hidden assumptions prevail and where any doctrine which does not implicitly presuppose this point of view is assailed as unintelligible. But even if we agree to remain within the confines of the scientific outlook, the aforementioned auxiliary premise proves to be suspect. For when it comes to the biological sphere, especially, our knowledge is generally insufficient to rule out in advance all but a single scientific explanation of a given phenomenon. Consider, for instance, the following argument. The direct evidence of evolution is based primarily on the significance of similarities found in different organisms, which are explicable only if they have derived the feature in question, structure or functions, from a common ancestor during descent with modifications, for the laws of probability insist that the fundamental similarities can be traced only to one single origin. But actually, the laws of probability can do nothing of the sort. What we know is that any two organisms belonging to some given group exhibit a host of anatomical, physiological, and other types of homologies. Now, the author is saying, in effect, that the likelihood of finding so many similarities would be very small if it were simply a matter of chance. And this is unquestionably true, 
In fact, it follows logically from the very definition of probability. But to conclude that the given correlations cannot be due to chance is not to say, by any means, that they must be caused by a common origin. For example, it is quite conceivable that every organism within the given group must perforce exhibit all these common features simply because no other blueprint would work, or work as well. In other words, all things considered, the given homologies may be necessitated by natural requirements. Now whether this is actually the case is not the question here. We say that this is a logical possibility, a conceivable explanation of the given phenomena, which does not conflict in the slightest with the so-called laws of probability or with any other known principles. And this is all that we need to say, for it proves conclusively that the fact of strong correlation does not in itself entail the hypothesis of common origin. From the start, the facts of embryology have provided one of the principal arguments in support of the transformist doctrine. Darwin himself has suggested that one might look at the embryo as a picture, more or less obscured, of the progenitor, either in its adult or larval state, of all the members of the same general class. And a few years later, Haeckel formalized this idea in his famous biogenetic law, also known as the Law of Recapitulation. It affirms that the embryo, in its successive stages of development, recapitulates the phylogeny of its species, or in more pictorial terms, that it ascends that hypothetical tree of life to which we have already made reference. But while it appears that this theory has commended itself for some time, at least to a majority of biological authorities, there have all along been voices of dissent, and even some notable advocates of evolution have eventually rejected the biogenetic law. In 1909, Cedric, for example, propounded arguments against recapitulation, which in his judgment disqualify the theory. Again, some embryologists, including De Beer, the proponent of clandestine evolution, came to the conclusion that the matter actually stands just the other way around, that phylogeny, namely, is based upon ontogeny. And in fact, De Beer and Swinton went so far as to say, in spite of the exposure of the theory of recapitulation, its effects continue to linger in nooks and crannies of zoology. Be that as it may, it will be of interest to recall at least a few of the arguments that have been mustered against the biogenetic law. We shall base ourselves on a study by Dewar, himself a former student of Sedgwick at Cambridge. It is generally admitted that there is no such thing as recapitulation in the embryonic development of plants. This is inexplicable if recapitulation be a law of nature, and if, as transformists believe, plants and animals are descended from a common ancestor. Transformists believe that birds are derived from ancestors which possess teeth, but no traces of teeth are found in any of their embryos. The head of the human fotus progressively lessens in relative size as it develops, instead of becoming progressively bigger as the evolutionary theory requires. While the growing embryo shows all the supposed ancestral stages of the urinary system, it shows none of the presumed stages in the transition of the respiratory system from gills to lungs. According to one of the mainstays of evolutionist doctrine, the modern horse is descended from an ancestor having five toes, yet the embryology of the horse exhibits no recapitulation of a five-toed ancestor. In this connection, Dewar points out that this does not prevent transformists from asserting that the presence of a tail in a human embryo from the fifth to the eighth week of its existence is the recapitulation of the stage of a long-tailed ancestor. This is supposed to be recapitulated, but not the five-toed stage of the horse ancestry. And regarding the embryonic tail itself, he makes an interesting observation. It is important to bear in mind that at an early stage, i.e. before the second month in man, the human, and indeed every vertebrate, embryo exhibits a length of intestine behind the vent or the anus. He who asserts that the human embryonic tail is a relic of a tailed ancestor must, if he be logical, assert that the post-anal gut is a relic of an ancestor that went through life having such a strange organ.
writers who dilate upon the human embryonic tale are usually silent regarding the post-anal gut. One final example, selected from the wealth of material which Dewar has brought to bear upon the question of recapitulation, may suffice to complete this brief review. It relates to the presumed fish stage and the development of vertebrate embryos, which transformists unfailingly cite as one of the most conclusive pieces of evidence. The truth is, writes Dewar, that the so-called fish stage of the embryo must be passed through for the same reason that during construction a four-story building must pass through a two-storied stage. He elaborates on this point in an informative passage, which we will quote at length. The so-called fish heart and gill arcs have to be formed because the head region of the embryo, from a very early stage onwards, requires a copious blood supply. This necessitates the early formation of a heart or a pumping organ and a simple system of blood vessels. These have to be formed before there is time to develop the four-chambered heart necessary to the higher animal. To accomplish this, one or other of the two devices must be adopted. Either a simple heart must be developed to function while another complicated heart is developing, or the simple heart must be so constructed that it can become transformed into a four-chambered heart while it is operating as a heart. In this case, the latter course is adopted, and by a most ingenious arrangement, the simple heart, while it is continuously working, is converted into a four-chambered heart, and some other organs, such as the kidney, the former is adopted. Another celebrated argument in support of the transformist theory is based upon the so-called rudimentary or vestigial organs. These are structures found in living species which are apparently superfluous. Organs, or parts in this strange condition, writes Darwin, bearing the plain stamp of inutility, are extremely common or even general throughout nature. It would be impossible to name one of the higher animals in which some part or other is not in a rudimentary condition. And here again, the transformist perceives evidence in support of his position. In fact, the case seems particularly clear-cut and convincing. What can be more curious than the presence of teeth in photo wells, which when grown up have not a tooth in their heads, or the teeth which never cut through the gums and the upper jaws of unborn calves? The intended implication, of course, is that these curious facts admit the transformist hypothesis as their one and only explanation. But here, too, the case proves to be far more complex than Darwin had imagined, and with an increase of knowledge, the picture has changed, as Violetan has pointed out. Certain of these supposed vestigial organs deserve special examination because they play a part that escaped the notice of Darwin. When he cited as truly vestigial organs and the germs of teeth in the photos of whales devoid of teeth in the adult state, and those of the upper incisors of certain ruminants, the gums of which they never pierce, he forgot that these germs in mammals, where they are very large relatively to the parts enclosing them, play a very important role in the formation of the bones of the jaws, to which they furnish a pont de poule on which these mold themselves. Thus, these germs have a function. And by way of corroboration, the eminent French antagonist goes on to observe that the disposition of these fertile teeth, their form and their number, different from those of other catacea, show that in the whalebone whale, far from being merely the relics of an extinct ancestor, they have an individuality and a causality peculiar to them, since they are multiplied and adapted to the length of the jaw. One might add that nonetheless the myth of the whalebone whale's teeth has survived, and to this day is often cited as an authoritative treatise, as a kind of gospel truth. Generally speaking, the prime difficulty with useless organs is that they may eventually prove to be useful. As in the case of photo teeth, the presumed vestige may well have a hidden use, perhaps only at some particular stage of embryonic development, or may be somehow necessitated by that development.
There is really no such thing as a plain stamp of inutility. There was a time, for instance, not so long ago, when the function of the endocrine system was virtually unknown, and when such organs as the pituitary and pineal glands could with impunity be paraded as vestigial. But with the advance of scientific knowledge, the list of such candidates has shrunk considerably, and as the matter stands today, their number is small. Moreover, such traditional showpieces as the splint bones of the horse, the lateral toes of the artiodactyls, the eyes of the cave-dwelling animals, or the wings of the sightless insects have either been disqualified or at least have come under serious suspicion. Even the veriform appendix in man has become controversial, for as one authority admits, in view of its rich blood supply, it's almost certainly correct to regard it as a specialized and not a degenerate structure. It is also interesting to note that whereas much has been made of the so-called vestigial organs, the subject of nascent organs is rarely brought up. Yet, as Dewar has pointed out, the theory of evolution calls not for vestigial organs, but for nascent ones, for rudimentary structures, that is, which are not yet of any use, but will become useful in their developed state. But it appears that no such organs have been identified, be it in the fossil record or in living species. So far as I am aware, writes Dewar, no fossil exhibits a nascent organ. The earliest known fins are fully developed, so are the earliest legs and wings, whether of insect, bird, bat, or pterodactyl. And with regard to living species, he remarks that if these species be really evolving, the majority of them ought to exhibit nascent structures in all states of completion, from unrecognizable excrescence to structures almost ready for use. Not a single one seems to exist. It has been suggested that the degree of genealogical affinity between members of various species may be reflected in actual blood affinities. Now it is easy enough to establish relationships between different types of blood. For instance, if small amounts of blood from one animal are injected into another, a reaction will generally ensue, resulting in the formation of an antiserum. And when mixed with other blood, this antiserum will cause a precipitation of blood protein, which can be measured, say, on a percentage scale. Thus, if one begins with animal X, the anti-X serum will cause varying amounts of precipitation, which may be taken as a measure of the degree of blood affinity with the blood type X. Anti-human serum, for instance, will cause 100% precipitation in man, 64% in gorillas, 42% in orangutan, 29% in baboons, 10% in oxen, 7% in deer, 2% in horses, and 0% in kangaroos. The unresolved question, of course, is whether these figures have anything whatsoever to do with genealogical relationships. And yet, protagonists of evolution have been sorely tempted to conclude from such data that among the given species, our nearest relative must be the gorilla, after which comes the orangutan, the baboon, the ox, and so on. There was a time, in fact, when blood precipitation data were officially interpreted in this way. As one of the early authorities explained in 1909, we have in this not only a proof of the literal blood relationship between man and apes, but the degree of relationship with the different main groups of apes can be determined beyond possibility of mistake. More recent expositions, on the other hand, tend to be markedly less dogmatic on this point. The Britannica article, for example, from which the above data were taken, merely affirms that these figures serve as a measure of chemical resemblance and affinity. But what kind of affinity, chemical or genealogical? The author does not say, and still inasmuch as the results in question have been presented under the caption, Evidence of Evolution, the implication is unmistakable. At the very least, this material has been used as a kind of bait. It may be interesting to note that the early enthusiasm in this area was sparked by extensive blood precipitation data involving some 16,000 experiments published by Natal in 1904. Now it seems that in the excitement caused by the discovery of blood affinities with apes, other aspects of the results have been roundly ignored.
there are humans, for instance, more closely related to certain monkeys than to their fellow men, and there are arc men as nearly related to carnivores, rodents, and ungulates as to their own kind. According to some data, one of our nearest blood relations appears to be the whale. It is hardly surprising that many contemporary treatises on evolution have quietly abandoned the genealogical interpretation of blood precipitation experiments. Another traditional source of evidence must not be omitted from this resume, namely the breeding and genetic experiments which throw light on the degree of variability of living forms. Darwin himself had been greatly impressed by the fact that new varieties of a given species can be produced through selective breeding, and in a sense, this observation forms the starting point of his theory. In other words, selective breeding was for Darwin the prime model of the evolutive process. What breeding does in miniature, nature can accomplish on a grand scale through the mechanism of natural selection. That was the gist of his idea. And so, The Origin of Species commences with a chapter entitled Variation Under Domestication, and one finds that the entire subsequent argument pivots on the concept of variability, which this body of observations is intended to exemplify. But in evaluating his claims, we must bear in mind, as much in fairness to Darwin as in the fairness of truth, that in 1859, modern biology was still in its infancy. In the absence of any information concerning genes, Mendelian inheritance, mutations, the endocrine system, and other vital factors bearing upon the variability of living forms, one was hardly in a position to hazard vast extrapolations from the observable facts. Looking at the matter in the light of present knowledge, let us now consider what the genetic facts are, and to what conclusions they point. Certainly, it is to be admitted, first of all, that domestic breeding does not lead beyond the limits of the species. Thus, after thousands of generations of breeding, a dog is still a dog, and despite considerable variation in size, proportions, coloring, and so forth, each verity obviously bears the characteristic imprint of the basic form. Moreover, it is well known that as one proceeds from wild stock to the higher breeds, the production of new verities becomes progressively more difficult. The potential for new forms, it appears, is not unlimited. And the picture remains substantially the same when it comes to scientific breeding experiments, such as the famous studies involving the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Although these experiments, involving millions of specimens and thousands of generations, have produced freaks in abundance, it seems that no new species has been formed. Even the application of x-rays, which increases the mutation rate by a factor of about 15,000, has not altered this fact. With other species, too, the result has been the same. Despite massive efforts expended over the better part of a century, no one has apparently succeeded in effecting a clear-cut transformation of the natural species. Stated in positive terms, this is overwhelming evidence in favor of the stability of living forms. As Collery noted already half a century ago, when he proclaimed la stability experimentalement constante des organismes actuels. Contrary to what one could imagine for some 50 years, Recent research has rather confirmed the idea of the existing stability of animal and plant forms and has relegated their variations either to purely individual phenomena without retention in the hereditary line or to a limited diversification virtually contained within the type of each species. On theoretical ground, the discovery of genes and the Mendelian mechanism of inheritance had dealt a serious blow to the Darwinian concept of unlimited variability. Then came the discovery of mutations, raising hopes that these quantum jumps might prove to supply the needed flexibility. Yet this too has turned out to be disappointing to the evolutionist. In the first place, it soon became well known that mutations are almost invariably detrimental. As a Nobel laureate has put it, 
Most mutations are bad. In fact, good ones are so rare that we can consider them all as bad. The expectation, therefore, that the prime mechanism for evolutionary progress should be found in a process which invariably goes in the wrong direction appears dubious from the start. But not only the direction, but also the magnitude of the mutational variations has proved to be disappointing. One knows today, writes Bonyar, through the studies of genetics, that mutation affects only relatively minor details and never carries beyond the cadre of the species. The question arises whether the picture has changed substantially since 1973 following the discovery of gene splicing or recombinant DNA research, as this technique is officially called. To be sure, extravagant claims have been put forward in great numbers, and as so often happens where evolution is concerned, the dividing line between fact and fantasy has been obscured. Thus we are told time and again that the so-called genetic mechanism of evolution has at last been laid bare, and that one is now in a position to understand precisely how evolution operates. As if we knew to begin with that such a thing as macroevolutionary transformations have ever taken place. There are those, too, who would put the case more modestly. It is claimed, for example, that molecular genetics surely gives a much better defense of Darwinism than is offered by paleontology, a statement which says very little indeed. But even this little seems to be premature, for as Edward Wilson, the Harvard evolutionist, stated at a recent meeting of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on the subject of Darwinism, the expanding synthesis with molecular genetics. Within a few years, we will begin to see some answers to evolutionary questions at the molecular level. Perhaps, but meanwhile, it is to be admitted that as things stand, molecular genetics doesn't have much to say about speciation, about macroevolution, or about rates of evolution, as Wilson goes on to observe. There seems to be a widespread expectation among the experts that someday it will. Ultimately, conjectures Rudolf Rath evolutionary mechanisms will probably be explained in terms of gene structure and rearrangements, but there is a very long way to go. To which one might add that before macroevolution can be explained at all, one must first establish that it exists, and here too, there is a very long way to go. In the meantime, like it or not, an invaluable constancy of species remains as the overriding experimental fact. Enough has been said to show that the doctrine of evolution is not by any means the well-founded scientific theory which it is generally held to be. It is true that a host of facts has been brought forward in support of the Darwinist thesis, yet from the start not a few scientists and thinkers including some of the most prominent exponents of evolution, have recognized the weaknesses of the empirical argument. Thus, Darwin, for one, was rather cautious in the expression of his views. Darwin himself never claimed to provide proof of evolution or the origin of species, admits the Britannic article. What he did claim was that if evolution has occurred, a number of otherwise inexplicable facts are readily explained. In Haeckel, the continental theoretician and renowned popularizer of evolution, went so far as to write to a scientific friend that one can imagine nothing more absurd, nothing which indicates more clearly a total lack of comprehension of our theory, than to demand that it be founded upon experimental evidence. Now it is doubtful that the British empiricists could have concurred with their continental colleague on that score. Yet it is clear that on both sides the theory was propounded largely on a priori grounds, and that whatever may have been the prime factors motivating and driving the evolutionist movement, the balance was tipped in its favor, not by any clear-cut evidence, but by rational and ideological considerations of various kinds. Dampier, for instance, a staunch evolutionist himself, admits as much when he writes, 
Haeckel and other materialists, and in their train Teutonic philosophers and political theorists, joined to create that Darwinismus which made many of his followers more Darwinian than Darwin himself. Men accepted natural selection as a proved an adequate cause of evolution and the origin of species. Darwin ceased to be a tentative scientific theory and became a philosophy, almost a religion. Leaving aside certain interesting implications contained in these remarks, it is clear in any case that the theory of evolution was a timely doctrine and that conditions favoring its reception had been prepared in advance by some of the major currents of European thought. As Hossein Nasir, another historian of science, observes, Rarely, in fact, has a theory connected with a particular science had such wide acceptance, perhaps because the theory of evolution itself, instead of being a scientific theory that became popularized, began as a general tendency that entered into the domain of biology. For this very reason, it soon gained acceptance more as a dogma than as a useful scientific hypothesis. To be sure, the dogmatic or a priori character of the doctrine remains largely unrecognized, and even in scientific circles, the belief is still widespread that evolution has been empirically verified beyond a reasonable doubt. And yet, surprisingly, the contrary is also admitted often enough. As a noted French biologist has put it, after informing us that we have never been present even in a small way at one authentic phenomenon of evolution. I firmly believe, because I see no means of doing otherwise, that mammals come from lizards and lizards from fish. But when I declare and when I think such a thing, I try not to avoid seeing its indigestible enormity, and I prefer to leave vague the origin of these scandalous metamorphoses, rather than add to their improbability that of ludicrous interpretation. What this scientist is telling us, in other words, is that despite the indigestible enormity of the transformist claim, and the fact that we have never been present even in a small way at one authentic phenomenon of evolution, he accepts the doctrine on a priori grounds because I see no means of doing otherwise. The quasi-official position, on the other hand, omits all reference to an indigestible enormity and maintains simply that the doctrine has succeeded in explaining in a perfectly satisfactory manner a host of otherwise inexplicable phenomena. But quite apart from the intrinsic difficulty of determining just when a given phenomenon is otherwise inexplicable, a matter on which we have commented before, this contention suffers on yet another account. For so far from being readily able to explain a multitude of facts, the evolutionist is actually forced to stipulate countless ad hoc hypotheses to save his theory. We have already come upon quite a few examples illustrative of this point. The lack of Precambrian fossils and the general paucity of connecting links. The quandaries associated with recapitulation, the absence of nascent organs, blood precipitation data teeming with absurdities, and la stabilité experimentalement constante des organismes actuales as a final embarrassment. Now, in every instance, the evolutionist has been able to counter with some special hypothesis, and usually, in fact, with a sizable collection of such theories. Confronted with the observed stability of living forms, for example, one can say that the time span or the number of generations in question is too small to permit the manifestation of evolutionary transformations, or that the given species has now arrived at a stage where such transformations can no longer occur. But although there is little evidence in support of such stipulations, and no agreement among the experts as to which are right, one nonetheless believes that there must be, in any case, some legitimate explanation of the unfavorable facts that safeguards the theory. And here again, the a prioristic nature of the doctrine manifests itself. 
Thus, when it comes to the endless multiplication of ad hoc hypothesis, the evolutionist does not perceive this as an instance of begging the question, simply because his main tenant is never really subject to question in the first place. Evolution is in effect a fait accompli, and not to realize this is to evince a total lack of comprehension of our theory, as Haeckel said long ago. By the nature of the case, the doctrine of evolution cannot be established on empirical ground, and by the same token, it is also in a sense unfalsifiable, as some contemporary philosophers of science have pointed out. This is both its strength and its weakness, its strength as a dogma and its weakness as a scientific truth, declares Bonnier. It is scarcely an accident that Darwinism established itself at a time when the Newtonian Weltanschauung had attained the zenith of its influence. There is an evident connection between the two doctrines, inasmuch as under Newtonian premises, Darwinism, in some form, becomes virtually inescapable. In a universe answering to the conception of a closed mechanical system, the possibilities are greatly reduced. Moreover, if it be assumed, as it was from the start, that the earth itself came into existence at some remote time, one has hardly any other way left to explain the genesis of life and the origin of the species except in transformist terms. Under such auspices, the means of doing otherwise are not at hand. So far as the general climate of scientific belief is concerned, it would seem that this situation has not changed significantly since the initial triumph of Darwinism. On the other hand, it is to be noted that with the collapse of rigorous atomism and the associated Laplacian determinism, the notion of a clockwork universe has lost its scientific sanction. One knows now that even an actual clockwork is based upon merely statistical laws. The real world thus turns out to be much less rigidly constrained by our physical conceptions than one had previously imagined, a fact which holds true especially in the small. In a very real sense, it appears that nature is far more mysterious in its workings than the 19th century had been led to assume. The very advances of physics have brought into light hitherto unsuspected limits relating to the explanation of natural phenomena in terms of any conceivable physical mechanism. As a matter of fact, there is now strong reason to suspect that the ordinary laws of physics do not apply to the highly structured forms of matter to be found within the nucleus of a living cell. We are referring especially to those gigantic molecules within the chromosomes, the genes, which control the entire structure and functioning of the organism. Now from a physical point of view, what mainly differentiates these substances from inanimate forms of matter is their basic aperiodicity. They resemble thus an elaborate painting wherein every dab of color plays a special role, in contrast to the inorganic matter which might be compared to a large piece of wallpaper wherein some simple pattern is repeated over and over again. Now, inasmuch as the ordinary laws of physics, the laws that we normally test and use, are inherently statistical, their applicability in the case of solids depends upon periodicity. By analogy, they apply to the wallpaper as opposed to the painting. Hence, from all that we have learnt about the structure of living matter, writes Schrodinger, we must be prepared to find it working in a manner that cannot be reduced to the ordinary laws of physics. This is not to say that no laws or physical laws are operative within the biosphere. Wherever there is life, there is order, and indeed a degree of order which vastly exceeds anything to be found in the inorganic realm. The fundamental problem, in fact, with which every living organism must contend, is to maintain this tremendous order in the face of ambient disorder, and one might add that all the vital mechanisms have seemingly been instituted just for the accomplishment of this task. Moreover, 
The organismal order is distinguished not only in degree as measured in terms of negative entropy, but in kind. It is what Schrodinger calls order from order as opposed to order from disorder. And undoubtedly, this difference is of the most far-reaching consequence. When it comes to the mysterious thing called life, even in its simplest manifestations, one is confronted by an entirely new picture. An especially noteworthy feature of living organisms is what might be termed the primacy of the whole. Now a whole is something that exhibits a multiplicity of parts. The analytic mind has a tendency, moreover, to reduce the whole to its parts, or in other words, to conceive of the whole as a mere aggregate or sum of its constituents. It will be noted that this point of view is entirely characteristic of atomism and of classical physics in general. But with the advent of quantum theory, the picture began to change. Modern physics has taught us, wrote Planck in 1929, that the nature of any system cannot be discovered by dividing it into its component parts and studying each part by itself, since such a method often implies the loss of important properties of the system. And as one moves from inorganic to living structures, this principle assumes a position of paramount importance. Thus, in the biological domain, one arrives, in fact, at the very antithesis of the mechanistic hypothesis. Here, it is not the whole that derives from the parts, but it is the parts, rather, that derive their existence as parts from the given whole. The organism is, of course, divisible into myriad components, but yet it is clearly one organism, exemplifying one basic form. We know, moreover, that this form is inscribed within the nucleus of every cell by way of the genetic code, and that from these centers it controls every aspect of life. One might say that the form itself is the center around which everything revolves, and from whence every organic structure is accorded its proper function. Now the great problem is to account for the origin of this form, or if you will, of this stupendous order. The Darwinist answer, essentially, is that order springs from disorder, or that the greater order derives from the lesser. Leaving aside the vexing question as to how primitive organic forms could have sprung from inorganic substances, the painting from the wallpaper, Darwinism maintains that the transformation of species is accomplished basically through the process of reproduction. Thus, it seeks to explain the origin of new organic forms through a biological mechanism whose natural function is just the reverse. The preservation, namely, of the given form from which also the mechanism in question derives its entire force and efficacy. For our part, we would find it difficult to conceive of a theory more directly at odds with what modern physics and biology have to teach. The mystery of living organisms resides in its form. Every part and every process of the organism, its entire four-dimensional structure, springs from that form. But what is this form, this principle of order from which the creature derives its life? To answer that question in a Christian key, one needs but to recall the rudiments of metaphysical doctrine. The momentous claim that the creation is a theophany and that every creature is by its nature a kind of effigy of the internal wisdom, as St. Bonaventure has declared. It follows, then, that what we have called the basic form of the organism can be nothing less than the manifestation of an eternal archetype, subsisting in the logos or wisdom of God. In the final count, what shines through the form as the principle of order and the source of life is the Logos itself. Yet granting that the form exemplifies an archetype, the question remains how the various species of plants and animals inhabiting our globe have actually been brought into existence. Were the species created by God at some particular point in time, perhaps within two or three 24-hour days, as some fundamentalists believe? Or does Christian doctrine admit 
of other interpretations more palatable to the scientific mind. Is it possible, in particular, to reconcile the Christian position with the transformist hypothesis? To answer these questions, let us understand in the first place that the action of creation is not to be conceived in temporal terms. We must not think that God created the universe at some time in the past, be it 6,000 or 20 billion years ago. The point is that time applies to the creation and not to God. So too, God acts, not in time, but in the beginning, a term which signifies the instantaneous and imperceptible moment of creation, as St. Basil explains. This beginning, moreover, which is indivisible and immediate, is none other than the non stands, the ever-present now, about which we have had so much to say in chapter 3. As Mr. Eckhart observes, God makes the world and all things in this present now. There is in reality no conflict, then, between the position that the species have been created simultaneously, all at once, and the apparent contradictory view that they have been brought into existence successively in a certain temporal sequence. In the first instance, we are looking at the matter from the standpoint of eternity, subspecie aeternatus, as the scholastics would say, and in the second, we are looking at the same thing from a temporal perspective. Admittedly, the second point of view is the one which accords with our normal disposition. It is difficult for us to understand how time gone a thousand years ago is now as present and as near to God as is this very instant. But then it is scarcely a cause for astonishment that we should find it hard to understand such things. The fact upon which Christianity insists is that all living creatures without exception have been created by God. Without him, nothing was made. John 1, 3. But in saying that all things have been created in the beginning, we must bear in mind that it was an everlasting beginning. My father works till now, Christ says, John 5.17. This leaves open the question whether God created the original progenitors of every kind or species in some special way, directly as it were, or whether he creates invariably through a concatenation of secondary causes. Now this question pertains to the modus operandi of the creative act as envisaged from a cosmological point of view, a matter about which scripture seems to have rather little to say. The Genesis account, in particular, merely suggests in very rough terms that the manifestation of terrestrial life has taken place progressively through an ascending sequence of living forms culminating in man. As has often been observed, moreover, there is nothing in scripture which clearly rules out the transformist hypothesis. We cannot say with absolute certainty that the transformation of species is impossible or that it has never taken place. Indeed, if it be true that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, then why not lizards from fish and mammals from lizards? But the question is, has he actually done so? And according to the mainstream of Christian tradition, he has not. There is, in fact, a consensus of belief among patristic and scholastic writers to the effect that the original progenitors of every natural species were not formed through the usual chain of secondary causes. They were not born from seed, but were brought into existence in a special way, answering more or less to the concept of direct creation. Thus, according to this doctrine, living creatures can originate in two ways— through a primary or vertical mode of generation, which does not involve seed as an intermediate cause, and through a secondary or horizontal mode, that is to say, by means of natural process. But at the same time, we must not forget that the natural process, no less than the primary generation, derives its entire efficacy from the power of God. Thus, in the last analysis, 
The distinction between the two modes pertains to the realm of appearances. It does not affect the ultimate cause, which is the same in both instances. What mainly troubles us in regard to primary generation is that we cannot see it happening, nor can we imagine how such a thing could take place. Yet this is nothing more than the predicament in which we invariably find ourselves vis-a-vis realities which transcend the confines of our world. To understand a phenomenon in a natural or scientific way, we must trace it back to secondary causes. But this is just what cannot be done in the case of primary generation. Perhaps there are no secondary causes here, as seems to be the case in miracles, or perhaps the causes are too subtle to fall within our reach. In either case, we stand before a prodigy, a phenomenon that shatters the normal illusion of a closed and self-sufficient universe. There are first origins, then, and indeed, there must be. Every chain of secondary causes traced backwards must eventually lead to the brink of a mystery. Even physical cosmology, it seems, has at last come to this recognition. Likewise, so far as biological chains of descent are concerned, there must always be a missing link. The only question is whether there are many, one for each natural species, or whether the branches of the genealogical tree trace back to one common primordial ancestor, so that the mystery of creation appears to be concentrated, so to speak, at a single point. Now, as we have just seen, traditional Christian thought has opted for the former of these alternatives by positing two basic modes of generation. It is interesting, moreover, that modern theories of evolution have likewise converged to the conception of a two-phase process, the so-called Zwe phasen hypothesis, wherein microevolutionary phases alternate with creative burst, through which fundamentally new forms are brought into existence. The main point of difference between the modern and the traditional doctrine lies, of course, in the interpretation of these explosive or discontinuous happenings. It is evident, moreover, that the creationist interpretation fits the paleontological facts far better than the transformist hypothesis, insofar as it obviates the vexing problem of missing links. Thus, the creationist is absolved from the necessity of postulating such a thing as Pierre Teilhard's automatic suppression of origins, nor does he require any other ad hoc hypothesis to explain away difficulties. Furthermore, the traditional doctrine is very well able to account for the existence of biological homologies, for as Titus Burkhart has observed, by its deepest significance, the mutual reflection of types is an expression of the metaphysical continuity of existence, or of the unity of the being. One could add that this suggestion may prove to be enlightening, even from a scientific standpoint. In the domain of the vertebrate, embryology, for example, the phenomenon which evolutionists have sought to explain through the hypothesis of recapitulation can now be viewed in a very different light. For if it be the case that man occupies a central position within the animal kingdom, a fact which can be understood from a metaphysical direction, then it need not surprise us if this centrality manifests even on an ontogenetic plane. This would mean that man can be viewed ontogenetically as the central trunk of a tree whose branches represent stages in the ontogeny of other living forms. In a profound and distinctly non-Darwinist sense, it may thus be true that the more primitive forms of life have actually descended from man. This quite possibly may be the great fact of which the evolutionist picture is but an inverted image. Let us remark that a scientific theory constant with this position has in fact been proposed. It was promulgated by Edgar Dacke, a German paleontologist of note, who had become persuaded that man represents the primordial form, or form, from which the main types of the animal kingdom have sprung. Now, as one might have expected, Decay's theory has been severely criticized in professional circles, even though it is by no means irrational or unscientific. 
As Carl Jung observes, the problem lies elsewhere. From the standpoint of epistemology, it is just as admissible to derive animals from the human species as man from animal species. But we know how ill Professor de K fared in his academic career because of his sin against the spirit of the age, which will not let itself be trifled with. It is a religion, or even more, a creed, which has absolutely no connection with reason, but whose significance lies in the unpleasant fact that it is taken as the absolute measure of all truth and is supposed always to have common sense upon its side. In short, there are means of doing otherwise, but they have been ruled out of court. Moreover, there is a traditional Christian doctrine concerning the origin of living forms which accords both with reason and with the facts. The hitch is that it accords not with the modern bent of mind, the spirit of the age, which will not let itself be trifled with.